Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> welcome to the city of Warren. Uh, welcome to the new semester and the new year. We are very glad to have our own faculty member to kick off this uh, season, Dr. Alex Connor. Uh, <coughs> he just joined us last year from Georgia Tech. Credentials so long, so we. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it over here. Uh, before we start, I uh, just want to uh, say uh, good luck with everything. Good luck with the new semester, and we are uh, so happy to have this uh, new TV forum series for me today. And such a crowd, and particularly here, we have a uh, team Michelle Addington here. <laughs> And then our uh, CRP faculty members, we have our uh, long good friend, uh, uh, my, uh, John Michael, from uh, uh, mayor's uh, office, Peter that Austin, and all the important individuals of this. Thank you again for coming to our city forum to talk session. So I will not read the details of this, the uh, bio. For, uh, Leave time for Dr. Khan. Let's welcome Dr. Khan. <coughs> Thanks, Ming. Um, so I'll just give a, a brief overview of my background. So I'm Alex Carner, assistant professor here at UC in community and regional planning. Uh, I was two years uh, as assistant professor at Georgia Tech as well in the School of City and Regional Planning there. Uh, my PhD is in civil engineering, so I come to planning from civil engineering. It took me it took me a few years to kind of make that transition, but um, the types of issues that I was concerned about in my research, teaching, and practice um, kind of were more in line with things that planners were thinking about and not really things that engineers were thinking about. So I'd go and talk to engineering audiences, and they would be like, you sound like a planner. You're not an engineer. And at the same time, I'd talk to planning audiences, and they would say that I sound like an engineer and not a planner. So it took me a while to figure out how to kind of square that circle. But now I'm here firmly uh, in the Planning Academy, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, today, my goals are just kind of give a, an overview of several uh, different kind of research areas in which I work, um, but all kind of related to this theme of transportation equity. Uh, when I was thinking about a title for the talk, uh, this, this idea of all of the above kind of came to me, and it seemed to summarize my work. Um, the idea is that it's not good enough to kind of just do one thing to do one particular type of analysis or to bring a single lawsuit or to wage one advocacy campaign to achieve transportation equity, it really seems like we need to do uh, all of the things that we can all of the time. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my work in kind of these three different areas in, in the law related to transportation equity uh, and the practice of transportation equity within the context of a, a regional transportation planning organization and then also related to um, advocacy for regional transportation equity. So what the heck is transportation equity? Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about this question of whether transportation plans, projects, and programs are fair. So who is benefiting from particular plans and projects and who is being burdened by them um, and whether the outcomes are fair. So I'm often thinking about things like uh, the relative share of funding devoted to different types of transportation modes or the relative shares of funding devoting, devoted to different modes of uh, public transportation, thinking about accessibility and opportunity gaps between folks who own cars and those who do not. And a lot of these things have kind of class and race lenses. So we know that people of color are more likely to rely on public transit to get around. They're less likely to own automobiles. They're more likely to use local bus as opposed to commuter rail. And all of these things um, kind of interact with the law, right? So there are laws related to anti-discrimination, fairness and justice. A lot of the focus in the US um, in this space has been on the metropolitan planning organization. So these are regional transportation planning organizations that are responsible for allocating large sums of money. Um, we could kind of debate, uh, maybe we will after, about how much authority they actually have um, to, to control these sums or to say whether a particular project is going to get funded or not. Um, they're, they're actually I would argue that they're actually a pretty good forum for getting at some of these issues because they bring regional stakeholders together and they have sort of mandated and well-established um, methods and practices around public involvement. So they're, they're sort of, they, they involve a lot of different types of stakeholders in their work and they have to comply with both Title VI, which is an anti-discrimination law, and environmental justice guidance from the federal government. I'll go into 
um, what those things are in a minute. Um, but what I found in my work over the past Geez, how long is it? I've been working on this stuff probably since about 2010 or so. Um, wrote my dissertation on related issues. There are real methodological limitations in the practice of assessing fairness and justice in transportation plans. Um, and the participation efforts, although they're open, right? Anyone can come and participate in the planning process. Uh, it's difficult to understand how that involvement or that participation actually affects uh, the the funding that's allocated to particular projects or the type of plan that's adopted. So there are public involvement processes, but how well do they work? Are they meaningful, right? If we conduct a particular type of quantitative analysis to get at this question of equity or justice, is it actually telling us what we think it's telling? Or are there different methods or different data sources that we can use? And so these are like the kinds of questions that I engage with uh, in my work. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is that civil society organizations uh, from the kind of advocacy and nonprofit sector can play a key <laughs> role here. So in a lot of the academic literature, if you look at the academic literature in this area, there are kind of one-off quantitative studies looking at, okay, is this particular situation fair? Is this region fair? What is the, the least just region? Um, I think those analyses are limited and we need kind of advocates kind of pushing for change. And I'll, I'll kind of justify that as we go forward. Um, so the way that I kind of chunk out my work and the way that I'm gonna structure the talk is in these three different areas. So I'm concerned about the law as it relates to transportation equity and transportation justice. Um, and we just had, uh, myself and some colleagues wrote a law review article that just came out in the Fordham Urban Law Journal. It was an invited uh, contribution. I'm gonna talk a bit about that. The problem with the law is that there are kind of tough legal standards. If you wanna bring a lawsuit alleging that a particular plan or project is unfair, the legal bar that you have to meet is, is actually rather high. Um, and courts tend to give agencies wide latitude. So if an agency conducts an analysis and says that they kind of comply with anti-discrimination law, the courts will defer to the agency in most cases. So the legal avenue is sort of, it's, it's tough to, to gain traction in this area. Um, I also do a lot of work on the practice, these kind of quantitative equity analyses that metropolitan planning organizations conduct and transit agencies conduct. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these things are kind of typically boilerplate. So the agencies are not really trying to understand what the pressing equity and justice issues are in their regions. Uh, they're mostly looking to check a box, right? They don't want to expose themselves to legal trouble. They just want to do the kind of bare minimum analysis that they can to kind of get through the process and go on to the next step. Um, and then there's also this kind of advocacy piece that I mentioned uh, where I think a lot of, there, there's kind of the greatest potential for change I think in part because the law is limited and the, these quantitative equity analyses don't seem to actually reveal evidence of inequity. So advocacy organizations are able to kind of organize, go to public meetings, pack the meetings, do advocacy in various different spheres and push for change. And so I'll show an example of how that was successful in one case at the end. So these are the kind of three areas that I'm gonna to touch on in the talk. And then I've got some implications at the end, um, just thinking about my own research and teaching. Okay, so as I mentioned, we just wrote a law review article it's pretty comprehensive. Um, if, you, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, I can send it to you. Uh, it's available, I think, on my website. Um, but the goal for the article was to kind of provide a one-stop shop for all of the law and kind of agency guidance and case law, so uh, legal cases that have been brought in, in court uh, related to transportation equity and justice. Um, the important, some of the important pieces, um, just summarizing, from federal law, are Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So Title VI says that if you're an agency that receives federal funding, you can't discriminate in your distribution of those funds. Um, there's also Executive Order 12898. So this was an executive order signed by President Clinton. Um, and it, this was guidance that President Clinton gave to all of his executive agencies that said um, agencies have to avoid disproportionately high and adverse effects on populations of color and low-income populations. And agencies also have to make sure that they're providing benefits to those populations in a timely manner. So the U.S. Department of Transportation is an agency of the, the executive. They have to comply with Executive Order 12898. Um, another piece that's become pretty relevant recently is the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Embedded within the Fair Housing Act of 1968 is this provision to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, so the goal is to replace current segregated living patterns with, quote, truly integrated and balanced living patterns. So this is, was in the original law in 1968, 
Um, and Nixon's first housing secretary, George Romney, actually tried to pursue this provision of the law very aggressively. And Nixon shut him down and it kind of went underground and it wasn't enforced at all um, in the intervening period until President Obama's Housing and Urban Development Department uh, actually wrote the rule to affirmatively further fair housing. And embedded in the rule is this requirement, right, to achieve truly integrated living patterns. And the way that they propose to do that is through an analysis of fair housing that includes things like access to opportunities. So there's kind of a transportation element. Um, it's not currently well integrated into metropolitan planning organization practice, but the heads of uh, housing and urban development, Department of Transportation, and I think the EPA all wrote a kind of dear colleague letter near the end of the Obama administration to encourage regional planning agencies to take this type of analysis seriously. Um, unfortunately, under the current administration, it seems like they're weakening the enforcement of this rule, and the first analyses of fair housing that were supposed to be conducted under the rule um, may not actually be reviewed. Um, so it's, it's sort of languishing right now, but I think it holds a lot of promise going forward. Now, one important takeaway from our, from our law review was that the law actually encourages agencies to go further than just doing that kind of check the box type analysis. So I've pulled out a couple quotes here. Um, we've got Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Title VI says you can't discriminate. That law needs to be sort of enacted at the agency level, right? So Department of Transportation, uh, if you're interested in, in some light bedtime reading, you can go to the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, read through 49 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 21, that talks about how the Department of Transportation actually enacts those anti-discrimination provisions. And there are actually these very, uh, this very affirmative language to remove or overcome the effects of discrimination where prior discriminatory practice existed. So if we look back at transportation planning history, we can see instances where um, highways and transit systems burden communities of color and low income, but those same communities do not derive very much benefit from it. So we need to think about how to overcome that prior discriminatory practice. And then even in the absence of prior discriminatory practice, we have to take affirmative action to ensure no future discrimination occurs. So I interpret these things to mean that agencies should be doing a kind of deep look and should be more introspective about what's actually going on in their region to understand what these key transportation equity issues are and then develop plans, programs, and projects to actually mitigate those disparities that they find. Instead of just, the current practice is kind of assuming that everything is okay, and then conducting a kind of ad hoc analysis at the end of the planning process to kind of check a box, um, but not really engaging deeply with these issues. But the, the purpose of the law review article is to make the case that there is this more kind of affirmative, proactive stance that they should be taking. Um, now, to demonstrate um, the kind of inadequacies of current practice. I'm going to just dig into one piece uh, that's going to be coming out in a book chapter later this year. I just presented it at the Transportation Research Board annual meeting where I'm actually looking into how agencies conduct these analyses, transportation equity analyses in practice. Um, I'm going to show this, uh, this figure that outlines the transportation planning process. If you've taken a transportation planning class, you're probably familiar with this. Jean-Claude, you probably show this in your, in your class. Uh, I'm going to dig into two pieces of this. Um, so the transportation plan and uh, what's called a transportation improvement program. Um, who knows what a transportation improvement program is? Okay, only a few of you. Okay, Jean-Claude, you know, it's you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to dig into these two things. These two things are pretty important. I think they have kind of outsized important in the kind of imagination of transportation planning. Um, the regional transportation plan is usually a kind of, it's a very slick document. So it's, it's, um, it's typically hundreds of pages long. Uh, graphic designers are sort of brought in to make it look really nice. It contains pages and pages of analysis. Um, it's sort of, it's supposed to embody and describe the region's goals for the transportation system and how their strategies, policies, and investments over the next 25 or 30 year period are gonna actually get at those goals. Um, and it also usually contains some kind of performance analysis. Uh, often the performance analysis relates to equity so this is an example from the Southern, Cal Southern California Association of Governments. This is their equity analysis or a page from their equity analysis. So here they're looking at outcomes of the plan in the future year, so 30 years from now, on different demographic groups in terms of access to opportunities. So this is kind of a typical equity analysis that, that would be conducted. Um, I've done some work digging into how these methods actually unfold. 
and whether they can be said to be um, truly meaningful. Um, and I find that the, the practice of equity analysis doesn't always align with the kind of lived experience of disadvantaged populations in a region. One key reason is that this analysis is conducted 30 years out, okay? If we're looking 30 years out, um, a lot of the, the pieces of the transportation plan that are included in year 29 and year 30 might not actually come to pass. This planning process is going on all the time. The funding situation is changing. Regional priorities are changing. Um, so that the advocates that I work with, they're often more concerned about getting a kind of more near-term analysis. They want to know what's going on in kind of four or five years from now, where we have much more certainty about outcomes. Um, the San Diego Association of Governments, for example, they were taken <coughs> they were taken to court, they were sued over their regional transportation plan because they had delayed um, some big investments in public transit until the out years of the plan. Um, and, and so they were able to demonstrate that their plan performed very well. But it's, it, our, our certainty about whether those transportation, those public transit improvements are actually going to come to pass is very low. So for this reason, um, I wanted to look at doing a kind of near-term analysis. So these are pages from the Transportation Improvement Program for the Houston-Galveston Area Council. Uh, the Transportation Improvement Program is kind of a companion document to the Regional Transportation Plan, but it's short term. So it lays out the, it, it links particular transportation projects to particular sources of funds. So each one of these snapshots is a particular transportation project. These are kind of phases of the project from preliminary engineering to construction. And then we've got the share of funding from different sort of pots, from local, regional, state, and federal. The TIP, which is the acronym, Transportation Improvement Program, I would argue is super important because these things are actually going to get built, okay? There's actually funding associated with particular projects, and it's happening in the short term. Unlike the Regional Transportation Plan, uh, where we have much less certainty about whether these things are actually going to happen. The problem with the TIP is that it looks like this. Right? So it's really dry. People don't want to dig through the tip and try to figure out what the heck is going on with it. They'd rather look at this kind of more visionary document, the Regional Transportation Plan. So compared to the Regional Transportation Plan, the tip has gotten much less attention, um, but I think that it's super important. So if you dig into what some agencies have done with the tip, it's not, it's not super common to analyze the tip, but some agencies have done it. This is one example from uh, the Stanislaus uh, Council of Governments in the Central Valley in California. They conducted a tip analysis, and, and this, is what they, this is what they did. So this is a map of their region. The projects that are in the tips, these are the transportation improvements that are proposed, are kind of outlined in orange there. And then the shading is uh, the proportion of households in poverty. So they overlay the tip projects on households in poverty. And then they're trying to just do a visual assessment for disparities, OK? And this is what they find. They say, a visual, a visual evaluation does not reveal noticeable trends or patterns of disproportionate impact. The distribution of transportation improvements throughout the county appears balanced, OK? I don't know about you, but I can't tell that just from looking at the map, right? Um, these census tracts that are out here um, are much larger in area, but probably contain the same number of people as some of the more dense um, urban areas in the center. Uh, we don't actually know where those people live. We don't know even what these transportation improvements are. They could be lane widenings. It could be a completely new alignment. Uh, it could be a rehabilitation. Um, so it seems to be a kind of deficient uh, analysis. And I, I kind of summarize agency practice um, in the Central Valley in this, this uh, uh, other paper that came out a couple years ago on transportation policy. So, my co-author and I kind of looked at the situation. We said, look, I think we can do better. So can we kind of advance practice? Can we advance tip analysis to get at some of the concerns of the advocacy folks that we work with um, and do a better job at getting at fairness and justice in the tip? So this is our research question. How can the tip be assessed for fairness? Um, and we wanted to consider a number of different um, elements. So first, we realized that all transportation projects entail both benefits and burdens, right? So in the prior tip analyses, uh, agencies would often assume that proximity to a project is a benefit. So if we're spreading the projects around the region, that's a, that's a good thing. But if you have a new highway being constructed outside your front door, 
Sure, you might enjoy some kind of benefit because you can then access that highway, but you're also gonna have some burdens associated with that, right? Noise, vibration, air quality. So we're, we came to the realization that those two things need to be assessed at the same time. We can't just assume that everything is going to be of benefit. There are also gonna be burdens associated with that, and we wanna, we wanna take those into account. Um, so similarly, we can't consider each one in isolation. Uh, the third realization is that not all groups derive the same benefit. So if we're building a highway outside your front door and you don't own a car, the benefit that you're gonna derive from that freeway is gonna be much lower than if you did have a car, if you're able to travel on that freeway. Similarly, if you don't rely on public transit and we're putting a new bus rapid transit line out your front door, but you're not gonna use that line, you're not gonna derive much benefit from it, but you could potentially be burdened by it. Um, and then finally, we argued that benef both benefit and burden decline with distance. So this is pretty clear for things like noise, air pollution, vibration. As you get further from a project, your burdens decline. Uh, on the benefit side, as you get further from a project, I would argue that your likelihood of using that project actually declines as well. So considering all these things together, we came up with uh, a kind of fairness standard. And we think that groups benefiting from a project and those that are burdened by the project should be the same. So there shouldn't be a mismatch between the groups that are burdened by a project and groups that benefit from it. And I'll show how we operationalize this in a second. So our study area was the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. This is the kind of metropolitan region centered on Philadelphia. It crosses two states, it's in New Jersey and um, Pennsylvania. These are some demographics just showing that it's kind of traditional um, white, the, the population of the suburbs is much whiter than the population of the central city areas. Central city area contains the largest concentrations of black and uh, Hispanic and Latino folks. <coughs> the reason that we chose to look at the DVRPC was not for any particular pressing reason, um, but they had really good data. So we wanted to look around and see if there was a place that had good data where we could demonstrate what a good uh, transportation improvement program analysis would look like. So you can just go to their website and pull down shape files that represent uh, every transportation improvement program project. And they're already categorized in terms of the categories here on the y-axis, and they've got their total project costs uh, listed as well. So the methods that we came up with is we wanted to try to compare the populations that were going to benefit from a project and those that were burdened by it. And we wanted to just, in terms of demonstrating the method, focus on those projects that were expected to have greatest impact. So we focused on capacity expanding highway and public transit projects. And we assume that the population that's gonna benefit from each type of project on the highway side is automobile owning households, and on the transit side is zero vehicle households. Now these things can be debated, um, but remember that we're trying to kind of move practice forward incrementally and try to get, get a method into practice um, that, that does a better job than, than is currently done. So here's what we did. I'm gonna kind of step through our methods. Here I'm showing, I'm gonna highlight one particular project. So this is one project in the tip, project 77211. It's a short connector from a state highway to the Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, located kind of in the northwest region, uh, northwest quadrant of the region. Kind of zoom in on that project. So these are just data that we pulled down from the DVRPC. Um, what I did was we constructed a buffer around the project, so a two kilometer buffer, assuming that, that the kind of re zone of benefit and burden was adequately captured within two kilometers. Then we overlay a surface of uh, zero vehicle households. So I took the total count of zero vehicle households at the block group level and just converted those to points. And then I can also overlay um, all other households. So these would be automobile owning households. Now what this allows us to do is look at the kind of population distribution that's proximate to the project, okay? So for every project in the tip, I went through this same kind of spatial, uh, spatial set of steps, and I calculated the population distribution around the project for both zero vehicle households and non-zero vehicle households. So you can think about it as um, basically generating a histogram so these bars here, I'm just counting up the number of households within each of these distance bins from the project um, to make things comparable between the zero vehicle households and the non-zero vehicle households. I use what's called a, a, a kernel density plot, so that's the smooth black line. Um, so that just makes sure that the area under the curve is equal to one, so I can compare the distributions to each other. And this is what it looks like, okay? So here are all 19 highway capacity uh, expansions in the transportation improvement program. 
I've got the population distribution for zero vehicle households in green for every single project and the population distribution for all other households um, approximate to the project as well. So if the kind of mass of the kernel density is closer uh, to the left on the x-axis, that means that that particular group is closer to the project. And so we can do some equity analysis by comparing these two distributions to each other. And within our kind of justice framework, to be considered fair, zero vehicle households should be located further from the highway capacity expanding projects than all other, other households, right? Um, we don't want zero vehicle households to be burdened by the highway expansion because they're not gonna be deriving much benefit from it. So there are three types of projects um, we can kind of highlight here. The two that I'm showing, these have their kind of mass of that density uh, for the zero vehicle households closer to the project than all other households. So these are projects where zero vehicle households are more heavily burdened by the project than automobile owning households. So these projects are potentially unjust. Um, there are projects where the distribution is more or less the same, kind of in the top right there. Um, so in this case, zero vehicle households are experiencing a kind of equivalent burden to non-zero vehicle households, um, but they're still not deriving very much benefit. And then the third case is where zero vehicle households are actually further from the project than are automobile owning households. So I would say that this type of project is potentially just. The other types of projects might actually be in need of some sort of rethinking or mitigation. Now, earlier in my talk, I kind of criticized um, these kinds of visual assessments. Um, so we wanted to have a kind of quantitative indicator of equity as well. So we can look at comparing these two distributions in various different ways. Uh, one way that we decided to use was to just look at the medians. So here, I can get the median of the distribution for zero vehicle households. So it's about, um, I think it's about 975. So what that means is that the, the median zero vehicle household within two kilometers of that project lives about a kilometer away. For all other households, it's about 1,200 or so. So they're a little bit further. You can see that their distribution is uh, skewed further to the right. And then we can just calculate the difference. So here it's negative, so about 210 meters difference. It's negative, which means that zero vehicle households are closer to the project than non-zero vehicle households. And then I can calculate this difference across all the different projects and then plot them on a figure that looks like this. So here's a really nice kind of summary of the equity implications of all the highway capacity expansions in the Transportation Improvement Program. Projects that plot this way mean that zero vehicle households are closer to the project than our automobile owning households. Projects that plot on this side mean that zero vehicle households are further away. And I'm also plotting a third, uh, third dimension on the figure, which is the total project cost. So projects that have higher costs are gonna plot in these kind of shades of blue and yellow. And we can see that the three largest cost projects plot on that left side. So these are gonna be the projects that entail the largest costs. They're probably gonna have the largest impacts and they're gonna be disproportionately burdening zero vehicle households, uh, folks that are not gonna be benefiting from the projects. Okay, so just to sum up from this piece, uh, it seems like in this case, at least, substantial resources are being allocated to capacity expansions that are gonna impose burdens on those who are not able to benefit from the same projects. Um, we can calculate these measures using uh, readily available data, and they're gonna be more meaningful than those that are currently used. Um, but it seems like it's, it's a little challenging to assess. Imagine you have a, a transportation improvement program that has hundreds and hundreds of projects trying to synthesize across all of these things um, could be difficult, but I think the, the key strength of this method is that we're able to kind of pick out projects that seem to, be, um, seem to be potentially performing the worst, so entailing the highest costs and having the kind of greatest burden um, on populations that we're concerned with. Okay, so that sums up the kind of law piece and the practice piece, um, and this is just this is just one kind of slice of my practice work. Um, I've done a lot of work looking at um, how we can use kind of advanced travel demand models to get at questions of transportation equity as well. But again, in kind of this all of the above framework, I think we need to move each of these pieces forward. And the tip in particular 
seem to be very important um, to the, the advocacy folks who, I, who I've worked with in the past and who I continue to work with. So they really wanted to see some kind of better, better analysis on that score. Um, the last piece that I'm gonna talk about is related to transportation justice advocacy. Um, the work here was conducted when I was at Georgia Tech. Uh, so my co-author was a, a master's student at the time. Um, and we've got a, a paper that's kind of under review. I presented at TRB a couple years ago. Uh, if you're interested in the manuscript, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the law is limited. Uh, the practice of equity analysis is also limited. Um, there, are, in addition to the kind of methodological limitations that I highlight in my work, it's often a challenge to get folks in a public meeting to actually understand the guts of a travel demand model or what's going on with a particular equity analysis. Um, so as a result, uh, the kind of advocacy around these issues of transportation equity and justice has exploded uh, over the past 10 or 15 years. So these are folks who are concerned with issues like um, affordability of public transit services, they're concerned with issues related to relative shares of funding, they're concerned with issues related to access and accessibility, they're concerned with gentrification and displacement that are related to kind of transportation and housing. Um, and these are the kinds of folks who I like to work with in general, because I want to make sure that my work is kind of grounded in uh, reality and is grounded in kind of the practice of transportation planning, and that my work is speaking to the issues of greatest concern um, to these types of populations. So the work that I'm going to present um, comes out of my, an interest in kind of understanding how these groups operate, how they go about, um, how they go about trying to make change in their communities and in their regions. So I'm going to talk about um, the Atlanta metropolitan region. Um, the Atlanta metropolitan region is, uh, it's pretty, it was a very, it continues to be a very interesting place to work. Um, it's heavily segregated in terms of race, um, and there's a, a vast disparity in terms of opportunity across the region. So historically what's happened is that opportunity has kind of started to concentrate in these northern suburbs in Cobb and Gwinnett and northern Fulton counties. And the counties in the south, South Fulton and Clayton County um, are much, um, experience much, much more disadvantage. And this is reflected in the racial demographics as well. Um, so we've got, you can look at the demographics here. So just highlighting kind of percent white, we can see the region overall is 50% white, city of Atlanta is 36. Um, the northern suburbs, Cobb and Gwinnett are somewhat more white but then Clayton County has a very low white percentage, so very high black percentage uh, in Clayton County, and the proportion of folks in poverty there uh, is higher than the regional average uh, as well. The red lines uh, outline the extent of the existing Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority system. So the acronym is MARTA. MARTA operates uh, heavy rail service and local bus service uh, in the region. And another thing to point out is that the city of Atlanta crosses the two county boundaries. So City of Atlanta is actually located in Fulton County and in DeKalb County. Now the question we wanted to look at here was how can we explain this curious event that happened in 2014, which was the expansion of MARTA into Clayton County. So the original MARTA region was just Fulton County and DeKalb County. The other counties had an opportunity to opt into MARTA in the 70s and they chose not to. So Fulton County and DeKalb County were the only counties uh, where MARTA was operating, so Fulton and DeKalb, uh, until 2014 when Clayton joined. So we wanted to try to explain that. So our research questions were, how can we account for the success of the Clayton County MARTA expansion? Sort of what drove that uh, story? Why did it happen? And can it be done elsewhere? So if we're interested in expanding transit throughout the region, or in other regions, can we learn lessons from that case that we could apply elsewhere? Um, the data and methods that I used were different from the data and methods that I used to look at practice. Um, they were mostly qualitative. So looking at primary and secondary sources, things like newspaper articles, magazine articles, histories of the region. Uh, and then we also conducted about a dozen interviews with key informants. So these were folks who were active um, during the time that Clayton County was trying to join MARTA. So I'm just gonna kind of run through the case um, and then give you some of my takeaways from it. So just some key events here. Uh, if we go back to the 1960s, this was kind of a heady time for uh, urban transit, uh, and specifically the, 
kind of expansion and, and creation of the first urban transit systems across the country in San Francisco, Washington, D.C., uh, and also Atlanta. Um, it was heavily pushed, this heavy rail system in Atlanta was heavily pushed by downtown, the kind of downtown business elite. They thought that it would give Atlanta the kind of image of a world-class city. Uh, Bus-only systems were proposed time and again, but they were kind of dismissed as second rate. Um, so this was kind of a, a similar story um, happened then and continues to happen now, I think, when bus systems are proposed uh, instead of rail systems. There's this kind of, um, people really love rail, right? They, they really want to believe that rail is the solution, and there's often a resistance to, um, to thinking that bus can kind of meet the same level of service or draw the same level of ridership. So this was uh, firmly at work then. Um, the first funding measure proposed for MARTA went on the ballot in 1968, and uh, it failed miserably. Part of the reason why it failed was because the folks who were in charge of MARTA at the time did not adequately take into account the concerns of, of the black community. So MARTA uh, is kind of being overlaid on this highly segregated landscape, and there were very clear kind of spatial equity issues where it, it, was, it was clear that the white population was benefiting more from the project than was the black population. So MARTA responded with a number of concessions, including changes to routes, and then in 1971, the funding measure passed, okay? So it had the potential to pass in Clayton, in Fulton, in DeKalb, and in Gwinnett, but it only passed in Fulton and DeKalb, and only by this narrow margin. And the black electorate was, um, was instrumental in, in achieving passage of the funding measure. Uh, as I mentioned, Clayton and Gwinnett overwhelmingly rejected the funding measure, so by a kind of 80 to 20 split. And they were less urban than Fulton and DeKalb and 95% white, so quite different demographics. The two reasons for the rejection of MARTA in the early years that come up in the kind of history of Atlanta were that these suburban counties didn't want to connect to the city, right? There were, there are kind of, there are, there are both explicit kind of racial reasons um, and kind of implicit racial reasons. So sometimes the, these concerns are coded as not wanting urban problems to come to these suburban areas, things like uh, uh, crime. Um, but then sometimes folks just get up and say that they don't want, they, they literally don't want black people coming to their communities and stealing their TVs. They're, these are like quotes from public meetings that are in the historical record. Um, there, so those concerns were definitely present, but there was also a kind of more instrumental concern, which is that Gwinnett and Clayton would only have gotten one station out of 40, and it was difficult for them to justify. So the funding measure that was at issue here was a 1% sales tax. So it was hard for them to kind of uh, accept this 1% tax um, in exchange for one station. Even though I would argue that's kind of short-sighted, and you could imagine that the system would expand in the future, um, but you know, not, notwithstanding that, they, they rejected. Now, what happened from that time, from 1970 to 2000, was massive growth in the Atlanta region, right? So this is a period known as the Atlanta boom, uh, massive business growth, massive population growth uh, over that time period. The growth was concentrated heavily in the northern suburbs, as I mentioned. So here I'm showing um, household income and also the proportion white. So household income is these solid lines here. The darker line is Clayton County. So you can see household income kind of stagnating in Clayton County increasing heavily in Gwinnett County, and at the same time, Clayton County becoming uh, its proportion of people of color increasing uh, much more than Gwinnett County. So we can see this kind of split starting to happen over this period from 1970 to 2000, where economic activity, growth, um, uh, the white population kind of concentrating in the north, and disadvantage, poverty, and people of color being concentrated in the south. Um, so, uh, against this backdrop, there was a pretty substantial um, event that happened in the Atlanta region in the late 1990s, which was a conformity lapse. So who knows about conformity? Okay, yeah, these like arcane transportation topics. Um, con conformity is when your transportation plan does not conform to the state's air quality plan. So you're in violation, right? If you go forward with the plan, your air quality is going to violate the national ambient air quality standards. And there are a lot of problems with conformity. I don't think it's a super good method at getting at air quality improvements, but regardless, it, it kind of worked in this case. If you're, in, if you're out of conformity, uh, you, you're at risk of losing your transportation funding, 
So Governor Barnes was the governor of Georgia at the time. He responded by creating uh, what, what became known as Greta, the Georgia Regional Transportation Authority. And he, this is kind of a, another fascinating case of regional governance where Greta on paper had a lot of authority, but they were very reluctant to kind of engage with and use that authority. There was a lot of pushback from kind of local governments um, at this time. But they did have some money and they wanted to use the money that they had to fund transit service. And because of the demographic changes that were going on, they thought Clayton was a great place to start a transit system. So they gave Clayton County um, an initial uh, grant that covered about 90% of the cost of creating a new transit system uh, for a three year period. And the hope was that additional funds would be, uh, additional funds would be found after that time to keep the transit system going. So Greta, funded uh, the creation of this new system called CTRAN in Clayton County. CTRAN started operating in 2001, and um, it was a major success. So by 2009, about two million rides per year, four routes, they were very heavily used. Um, over the time period that CTRAN was operating, those demographic trends that I showed earlier continued. So Clayton County's median income continued to drop and the poverty rate doubled. This led to some problems with revenue at the county level. So we had initially Greta kicking in money. The county was able to get money together after the Greta money went away, but with this kind of declining tax base, the county was under pressure to cut, to basically balance their budget, and CTRAN was one of the first things on the chopping block. So uh, the county commission voted to cancel CTRAN operations unceremoniously, and they just stopped all transit service. So March 2010, this county that had had public transit no longer had it. Okay, so transit just goes away. Um, there was a state representative at the time who was very active, uh, a rep state representative representing part of Clayton County, kind of in, in the, the northern part closest to the uh, city of Atlanta, Roberta Abdul Salam. She led the formation of this kind of advocacy, this, this uh, ragtag group of advocates called Friends of Clayton Transit. This is the very same month that CTRAN uh, ceased operations. She brought together folks from civil rights organizations, labor and environmental groups. Um, to push for Clayton County to join MARTA, okay? To kind of realize the promise of this regional transit system that they had not joined in the early 70s. Now they wanted to join. They wanted to join because they felt that it would provide much more stability than having a kind of county level uh, transit agency. If they join MARTA, they pay the 1% sales tax, then they have the kind of certainty uh, of MARTA. They weren't able to get a binding referendum on the ballot in that November, but the county commissioners agreed to put this kind of straw poll, which was kind of silly, um, but it basically said, you know, do you support Clayton County joining MARTA? Yes or no, but it had no force of law. There was no funding associated with it, but it passed overwhelmingly. 67% of voters in Clayton County supported that kind of straw poll. So this led folks to believe that, you know, this, this thing had legs. They might be able to join MARTA uh, if they kept at it. Um, there were a couple things that happened in the intervening four-year period. I won't go into them in great detail, but um, in 2012, there was a proposed um, uh, regional transportation tax initiative that failed, and it kind of derailed some of these Clayton County-specific efforts. So everybody in Clayton County had kind of put their eggs in this kind of regional transportation tax basket, um, and it, when it failed, they had to do something else. So we'll just fast forward to 2014. After this regional tax had failed, they realized they had to do something at the kind of county level. Um, they had to do kind of advocacy at the state level to get the state to say, okay, Clayton, you can pass a sales tax to join MARTA. It required a kind of legislative act at the state level. They did that, the governor signed this law. Um, and then Friends of Clayton Transit and other organizations uh, led outreach efforts to kind of get the word out about this measure that was gonna be on the ballot to, to join MARTA. And there, they did, a. a there was this organization called Citizens for Progressive Transit. They made all these kind of slick graphics. Um, there were Facebook groups, lots of social media uh, work, prayer vigils, et cetera. Um, and so in the November election, uh, the, the midterm election, the binding referendum to join MARTA and Clayton County passed with this overwhelming margin, 73 to 27. I have not seen other ballot initiatives that have passed uh, with such uh, overwhelming strength. Um, and by all uh, accounts, it seems to be a, a success. So folks in Clayton are, are happy that um, MARTA is back, or that transit is back, and it is in the form of MARTA. Um, 
And there are kind of specific details we can talk about if folks are interested um, related to the potential to extend MARTA heavy rail into Clayton County in the future. Um, but I want to just get to my kind of discussion points. So what explains the Clayton County case? Um, I think that the demographic changes at work, I already kind of hinted at this, laid bare the need for, for public transit, right? So these are folks in Clayton County that, uh, whose incomes are very low um, and for whom public transit would, would work very well as an affordable um, option. Um, most of the jobs are kind of concentrated in areas that are kind of not in Clayton County that are further north. So if they can use transit to get access to those jobs, it's a kind of a good thing. The conformity labs provided the initial funding. Um, and then that positive experience with the initial C-TRAN system um, laid the later foundation for MARTA membership. So I have a, a quote from one of my interviewees who uh, worked at, uh, she worked at Greta for a time actually. She said, C-TRAN whetted their appetite. They got to see free of charge that they gained much greater mobility, access to jobs in the immediate area around the, the airport. So this idea that C-TRAN planting that initial seed led to uh, MARTA, uh, Clayton County joining MARTA later on. Um, I think also this kind of discrete disruption was key in this case, right? So we had a transit dependent population. We had folks, I have quotes from my interviewees saying, look, we moved to Clayton because there was transit there. And then having transit kind of go away um, led to rapid action. It seemed like something had to be done. Um, some of my interviewees talked about also these kind of economic concerns related to job loss and businesses relocating. Uh, so this is a quote from actually from Roberta Abdul Salam, who was a state representative at the time. She's talking about the kind of negative impacts on the county, um, and so wanting to get transit back to avoid further losses like this. And then finally, um, a kind of theme of my work more generally is that organizing and advocacy is super important. Um, I think this is a really good example of the power of these organizations to make real change. Um, in this particular case, the faith community actually made a, a big difference. That's why we call the paper Pray for Transit. Um, these are these, the black churches in Clayton County were just places where large portions of the population went every Sunday. Um, and the ministers in the churches outlined the policy and told folks where to go and what to do. Um, and they engaged in, in the politics of transit, basically, and it was a huge deal. Um, at the same time, a lot of the organizations that engaged, there was Sierra Club, um, folks like Citizens for Progressive Transit, these are organizations that had kind of large war chests that they could draw on. Um, so Sierra Club, I talked with them, and they, they didn't have any funding specifically for Clayton County, but they just had, had funds on which they could draw to support basically having a full-time organizer in the field in Clayton County. Um, and that allowed them to do stuff like this. So this is one of my uh, contacts, one of my key informants was an organizer who talked about how they were flooding every county commission meeting in every public comment period, first with 10, then 20, then 50, everybody wanting to talk about transit. So they'd be having a county commission meeting about something that was entirely different, but they would always be talking about transit. Okay, so to conclude, I think there were kind of three key drivers here. The case, it challenges existing transportation equity frameworks because a lot of the analytical methods around transportation equity are related to looking at, you know, what is the impact of the plan? What is the impact of the program, right? Is there a disparate impact? In the Clayton County case, transit just went away, right? It's not like funding was going away from CTRAN and to another public transit agency. Um, there's nothing in the law that, that necessarily prevents the, just the, the blanket elimination of service. So folks in Clayton weren't able to look to things like environmental justice regulations or civil rights, um, the civil rights law. Um, I think the elements of Clayton County, the kind of demographics, the strength of the faith community are pretty unique um, and they're not likely to be replicated exactly in this way elsewhere. But organizers in Atlanta are kind of shifting their effort to Gwinnett. Gwinnett is a very diverse county. They think it might be the next domino to fall uh, in joining MARTA. And then at the state level, there's increasing discussion of a regional transit solution. So the state legislature convened a kind of panel uh, or committee on regional transit solutions. Uh, and there's the potential for the state to actually commit tr new transit funding um, to transit agencies, which they haven't done in the past. Okay, so to conclude, just kind of synthesizing, reflecting a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of my work is on methods. Um, I think methods are really cool. I love GIS, I love data, I love crunching numbers. 
But I think in terms of thinking about what's actually going to move the needle on transportation equity, I think methods are kind of a small piece of the overall um, strategy. And we have to think a lot about to make our methods, data, and analysis truly meaningful, we need to kind of share our results with the public, uh, with folks who are actually struggling to um, struggling with issues of affordability, with gentrification displacement, with access to opportunity. Um, and the, the way that I kind of connect this up with my, with my teaching is just realizing that there's a lot of, there are a lot of practices in transportation planning, in performance analysis that are, that are not very meaningful um, and that are, you know, they're, they're borderline um, dishonest. And so I try to bring these kind of more advanced methods, this kind of commitment to doing advocacy into the classroom so that I can train future planners um, to, to take these methods with them as they go out into the kind of professional workforce. Okay, so I'll close there. I think I've used all my time. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or discussion. Thanks for your attention. Bob. Yeah. So as I, I was watching your curve, and I was certainly thinking about um, that not all places and all communities are equally burdened from the go. So did you think a little bit about what you have is a, a metric for direct <coughs> effects, mm -hmm. indirect and cumulative effects, or yeah. another aspect of burden that we on the depot we have to analyze and think about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there's a there's a way to even incorporate that as well. Mm, yeah. An incremental analysis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think there we we didn't do that. Um, I think there are probably a few different ways to do it. I mean, one way California has this tool called Cal Enviro Screen, right? Which looks at it's sort of this cumulative um, impact indicator. It was calculated at the zip code level before, but I think it's maybe at the track level now. You could just do like a simple. Uh, like yes, no, is this project located in a Cal Enviro screen kind of 90th percentile community? And if it is, then there's already a number of cumulative impacts that you want to take into account. You could probably get more precise too and kind of look at the existing network of transportation infrastructure and try to calculate some kind of baseline measure of burden related to existing highways, existing transit systems, and then somehow factor in the more incremental analysis. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I could potentially look into that going forward. Other questions, Greg? Um, I think, so I have a paper that just came out um, that I think is pretty, it, it, it's, it's a good kind of encapsulation of some of my recent thinking in this area. So I think, you know, you can have people that are well informed, but if you have an agency that is, that doesn't have the best interests of disadvantaged communities in mind, then they're going to be able, you can kind of conduct an analysis that's going to say anything, right? So I think what needs to happen to actually move the needle on this stuff is to kind of acknowledge that it's a problem from the outset and then commit resources to trying to fix it. Um, so in the paper, we argue that if we truly want to make progress on transportation equity, we need to listen to disadvantaged communities in our region, identify what their priority unmet needs are, and then devote some funding to address those priority needs. And I think this is more in the spirit of the kind of proactive, um, affirmative uh, standards that are embodied in the law, but not often enacted in practice. So I want to continue to pursue that. Um, but you know, I like, I like playing with data and stuff too, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing that. 
I see, I, you know, I, I do, I, I see all these things as kind of uh, integrated and no, no one thing is actually going to do it. And I try to just get in front of people and, and talk about this stuff as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah, so looking at uh, just like the ending effects of what happened in Clayton County, mm -hmm. just like for, my, for me personally, being organizing in transportation and faith based uh, organizing as well, so that's exactly what you're talking about, yeah. how to get the word out. It just, to see um, just the baseline of, you know, services that we give to certain people, um, I mean, what they were fighting for when they really wanted transportation back to the baseline of service. Yeah. Nothing more and advantageous for them to, you know, make up the ground with some of the jobs and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, things they, they lost, but just like a baseline service to get back to, I don't have a way to get around and I need transit. So that's what we saw, or that's what I view we saw there. Nothing more, you know, really dealing with the numbers and uh, yeah. more, uh, more dealing with some of the demographic change that you talked about. Uh -huh. And so that was a real problem for me, is actually dealing with, our right, people don't have access to jobs, even if we have a transportation <coughs> system, it still takes 45 minutes to get to the northern part, uh, northern county, to get to those jobs. <coughs> so when I initially heard that, you know, the people denied in the 60s, getting, uh, having MARTA or whatever, joining that, I think some of those problems still haven't been solved. And we need access and we need, it right now. I can't wait, uh, yeah. you know, for the next round. Like, we need problems now, understanding that it was civil rights time during the 1960s. So even today, when you have wins such as that, it's hard because you're winning, but you still haven't had an advancement from your initial state. You're just trying to get back. Yeah. Um, so have you thought of that in terms of uh, what to do next? I know you're trying to go into the next county, but how to get back to what is advantageous, advantageous for the people and not just like a baseline of service that could debatable but should be available to everyone? Yeah, I think part of the answer is that um, it's not, you know, where I'm a transportation person, so I'm often thinking about this in terms of transportation, but it's also, there are also issues related to kind of like housing and access to housing and affordable housing and exclusionary zoning. So should, does it make sense to, for example, connect uh, Clayton County to Metro Atlanta using heavy rail, right? Maybe it, maybe it does. Um, but would it also make sense to try to site more affordable housing closer to concentrations of low-wage jobs in Cobb County and in Gwinnett County so folks can actually live there, right? So there's this like multi-pronged strategy. Um, that is the sort of stuff that comes into play when we're thinking about the analysis of fair housing. Right, so where people are actually able to live, what the patterns of segregation are, and what policies and practices are needed to overcome um, segregated living arrangements. So, I mean, I, I agree with you. This is like, this is the kind of bare minimum. Um, but, you know, it, it was a big win. The planning process will move forward. MARTA will continue to work in Clayton County. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, I think, Given the way that decision making in Atlanta and elsewhere works, I think those those kinds of incremental changes are probably the best that we can hope for, um, and we just need to keep pushing for change. And folks in Clayton are still kind of doing it. We, I mean, we should we should talk more about this um, offline. Yeah, John Claudia. Sure. Um, I wonder if you you're obviously looking for a measure that can be implemented in practice and be also intuitive in thinking about how to assess the distribution of benefits and burdens, did you play with other ideas other than just looking at the proximity to a project with the notion that um, <coughs> proximity to a project doesn't necessarily mean that you know, adjacent po you know, those adjacent populations are going to be the only ones that benefit? There could right. be region-wide benefits mm -hmm. in terms of the locations of firms, mm -hmm. uh, locations of uh, Residences that are being calculated based on these regional transportation improvements. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one piece. And then um, the second question is uh, asking how you would how you would answer some of the literature that talks about the importance of access to private vehicles uh, mm. for people of uh, low income and for really being the, the linchpin for enhancing economic opportunity. Yeah. I think most of the studies that 
done to look at that. So, so it, it's always pointing at, well, we could have a lot of transit or we could give people access to their own vehicle right. or some kind of access to a vehicle. Yeah. And far and away, that produces better economic outcomes. Yeah. Um, so your first question, um, of course, you know, there's a lot that is not in the analysis. I think this question of the, the issues that you raise are super relevant, but there's also issues of just like accessibility. So how does accessibility change? The ability for folks to access different numbers of jobs or educational opportunities or um, uh, healthcare, et cetera. Like that's just not in the analysis. So the goal, my goal really was to kind of just make a first incremental step. I have done other work on kind of thinking about accessibility. Um, <coughs> on your, your other comment, I mean, this is something that I, I think about quite a bit. So you're referring to the kind of like Evie Blumenberg, uh, UCLA school stuff, yeah. I mean, I don't know, like is that the kind of world that we want to live in where we're just going to give everybody cars? I think that those analyses, they make sense given the kind of current landscape of urban form and transportation infrastructure, right? Like, yeah, if you give someone a car and they don't have to rely on transit, their economic outcomes are going to improve. But I would prefer to think about like, okay, we have climate change, we have air pollution problems, we have um, crippling urban congestion. Like, is giving everyone a car the solution to that? Probably not. Um, so I just, I, that's, I see those studies as being kind of like, they're, they just seem like fatalistic. I don't really, I, I don't disagree with those findings, but I just don't want to live in that world, you know? So I don't know if you disagree, but. Well, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I certainly um, feel similarly, but I yeah. think also that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about people's livelihood right now, mm -hmm. right in the present. And yeah. um, I think there, there is, particularly with new advances in vehicle technologies and sort of the sharing economy, uh, with new vehicle services that are out there, it definitely changes the landscape of what we can anticipate or what we can imagine for providing mobility for mm -hmm. um, <coughs> low-income and disadvantaged populations. Yeah, I mean, automated vehicles could be a game changer in this space. Um, I think there are real issues related to just like access to banking, access to cell phones, ADA type access to the vehicle is going to be a big deal. Like are people who rely on paratransit and on-demand services now going to be able to get into an automated vehicle? I think people that are excited about automated vehicles think like whatever that stuff will get figured out, but I think they're actually kind of uh, important. Um, but yeah, I think the things are kind of, things are kind of changing now, but it doesn't get around the fact that in, in the densest urban areas, public transit is gonna be the solution. That's the only way you can move large numbers of people into dense urban areas during peak periods. Not everybody's gonna be getting into an automated Uber and then getting to, getting to work, right? Like if there's still, you don't get around congestion with automated vehicles. So yeah, in, I mean, I interesting questions. Yeah, question here. Oh, we have to end? Last one? Sorry, okay. I, I actually kind of had a question about your burden and benefit analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where the low income jobs were, <coughs> like maybe like a bus route there would be beneficial to people. But mm -hmm. you know, within two kilometers, it might be that everybody within two kilometers of these jobs that live there actually do have a vehicle. And I was wondering yeah. if you looked at any ways to incorporate not just where they were coming from, but where they were going. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's, it's actually not that hard to get that information. There's a data source that I've worked with quite a bit called the LEHD data. And that has a big, it's like a nationwide um, origin destination matrix of home and work location. Um, so it would be possible to incorporate that type of information, but I haven't, haven't done it here. Could be a next step.